All right, hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to give you some advanced node tips for the shader editor in Blender. So these are just a few things I've been keeping in mind when making my own procedural materials. So we're not going to go over too many, but I think these are some important things to keep in mind. And they would also probably benefit speeding up your shader workflow as well. So the first thing we're going to talk about is not discoloring your masks. So in a lot of my procedural material and shader videos, we talk a lot about masking. Now masking is a super important concept because it's basically a way of telling Blender where to put certain elements of your material on the object but also it's more than that because it's also a mathematical thing which I'll try and describe okay so I've got a material here it's quite basic it just looks like this we have our principal BSDF we've got a ambient occlusion with a color ramp we also have a similar thing up here we've got an ambient occlusion with a color ramp but this one is colored whereas the one from before is just a black and white and then we have a texture coordinate node with a custom node group and a colored color ramp okay so the whole point about this is I'm going to show you the difference between using a colored mask because ambient occlusion is technically a mask. It basically just shows where meshes are coming within proximity to each other. And I'm going to show you the version of using the non-colored version of the mask here and how it can be used for some extra features. So let's take a look at this. We've got an ambient occlusion node plugged into a color ramp and I've given it some kind of like brown and gray values. Let me just bring this over. If I plug that into the base color and make sure it's the only thing plugged in, we can see what's going on here. So from the left to the right, we're basically going from crevices to open space. So as I drag this dark brown one along, you can technically see how as we're moving it along that gradient, it's going to be affecting different distances from the crevice. This might be a bit easier to see if I turn on the denoising here. It's a bit slower, but it's okay. So say for example, you were doing some grungy dirt stuff like I've done quite a lot in my projects. This is a very quick and easy way to get that effect, but it is a bit limited because this is a very smooth and simple gradient. What if we wanted to add a pattern to it? Or what if we wanted to recycle this data to say a the roughness from the inside of the crevice compared to the outer areas like we need that mask data to be able to make calculations like that now of course we can do some weird mixing after the fact like for example if I bring in a mix RGB node we could use this as the factor input maybe bring in a noise texture and another color ramp let's kind of plug that in there let me turn the scale up Okay, so the thing is, the reason why this doesn't really work too well is because we're using colored data, which is going to essentially affect the mask. Because we're using dark colors, we're not getting an accurate representation of where the outer areas are, which would be over here, and where the inner areas are. So for example, if I brighten up the last handle there, you can see that we're getting a more accurate effect because the white of the values representing 1 or 1.0 or 255, if you're thinking about it as like an RGB color value, but basically just think of it as like 0 to 1, where black is zero and one is white. Okay, so white is our useful data. White represents accurate data for where the higher point of the mesh is going to be. So when we're using masks, if we're discoloring them, we are affecting that data. So notice as I go for darker blues, it's giving us a less accurate representation. So if you're going to use the color and also recycle it, they can't necessarily be the same thing. Well, they can, but you're gonna have like a really janky time. So if I plug this in there and plug that there, you're gonna have a really janky time like trying to use it as a color and a separate mask at the same time you can have to really like balance the values and get it like perfect and then it's going to be more difficult to adjust in the future so the point of this tip being don't discolor your masks is to appropriately separate the mask data from the color data and that's what we're going to do down here in what I call the parallel mode so we'll call this the linear mode where we're basically passing the color through the mask at the same time and sending that down to the output the parallel mode is a bit different. So for example, I have the ambient occlusion going down to the color ramp. And if we plug that into the color, we can see the mask exactly here. White representing where we want stuff to be placed. So in this case, grunge and dirt. And if I plug this color color ramp in, we basically just have the grunge effect happening over the entire mesh. So just for reference, this imperfection splotch node group comes from my procedural patterns pack, which is a paid pack. And it's, you know, quite a nice little complex procedural pattern there. So we have these two things running in parallel. Parallel. We have the mask and we have the color pattern. So when they're running in parallel like this, they're very easy to mix together properly. So all we do is we plug the color of the mask into a mix shader node as the factor value there. Like honestly, just substitute the word fact for mask because that's all it means here. The first color is going to be the general color for the mesh. So we've just got that set to a gray. And the second one is going to be our grungy effect. So then if we plug this into the base color, what do we get? We get the grunge and inside here we have the pattern. So now if we modify the mask, so if I keep the black on the end there and drag this white back and forth, you can see we have more of that grungy pattern growing out. That's just for the color. 
But keeping these separate like this means that we can recycle the mask data without affecting the color. So say if I wanted to modify the roughness or the reflectivity of the rest of this mesh, by using this mask, I could just plug this straight into the roughness because it's a black and white and that would technically work. You can see that the outside is reflective and the inside is not reflective, so that's fine. But because it's just black and white data, we can pass it through a math node. I've got it set to add and if I plug this in, then this is basically our way of controlling the outer roughness there. So you can perform any kind of other mathematical operation you like, but it basically means that keeping these things separate means that we can recycle this mask data wherever we like in other parts of the material. So basically this tip is just keep things in parallel, keep them separate so they can be recycled easily, rather than coloring up your mask here and then trying to use this for multiple different purposes because it's going to like affect your results quite strangely, you're going to get something very different. So let's take a look at a more advanced demonstration quickly. So this is another material in my procedural patterns pack, I call it the black wall material. So the point of this material is to have like a kind of obsidian like surface where a universe is kind of like bleeding through the cracks. It's a very science fiction-y type thing. So we have a value for that. Now it's not a very clean material if we go inside. I'm not going to show you the whole thing because it would take ages to explain. But I have a bunch of my other pre-made node groups here. But one part of the material I want to bring your attention to is this one down here. Next to the noise texture we have a color ramp because this color ramp pretty much decides the internal volume for the material as well as a few other things I think. So basically if I go inside of this sphere there's like this kind of universe cosmic volume thing going on. It's quite a complex material. Now the pattern for this volume is quite an important part of the process but if I expand the node group here if I move this ramp around you can see it's going in many different directions both the color and the alpha. This is the whole point about recycling. We can see these links going into different parts of the material and even this mathematical one here is going elsewhere. So we have the volume pattern. This goes and then is recolored. So for example, if I go inside here, I can recolor that. We go to blue, greens, reds pinks, etc. And then it's also recycled for the emission strength. So that goes in here, which then goes to the emission strength. And then it also acts as a mask as well. So this is just to show you that, yes, if you're creating procedural masks, whether it's for ambient occlusion or some kind of generated texture, it's always a good idea to keep the black on white masks so they can be recycled. OK, so the second tip I want to give you is about collapsing your group inputs. So when you're making node groups, they can be quite complicated on the inside. And just for reference, this material here is contributed by Mel. It's in our community material pack. It's a free project, a collection of CC0 materials you can use for everything contributed by the community. You can download that on my Gumroad if you like. It's um, asset browser compatible as well. So here you can see like the different materials we can drag in and use. Anyway, so it's a procedural clay material. And if I go inside the node group, you can see it's quite nicely organized. It looks a bit like a circuit board. It's maybe quite expanded horizontally horizontally and we could probably cut that down quite a bit but for now you know it looks quite good it, we don't have too many overlapping cables and wires or noodles or node links whoever you want to call them strictly speaking if we're looking at different parts of the material here we can see exactly which inputs are going into exactly which nodes you know it's very clear to understand well explained everything is labeled appropriately and we don't have like too much unnecessary node space for example if I click on one of these node groups here and press Control H and expand it, we're going to see all of the inputs. Now one thing you'll tend to do when you start making procedural materials like this into node groups is it's quite often the case that you'll have one group input node and connect the links entirely across the material from one node. That's a very common thing to do, but it can get very messy. And to demonstrate that, I'm going to show you a version of the same clay material with a single group input node like this. OK, so let's take a look here. You can see that these noodles are going all over the place. They're overlapping and it makes it extremely difficult to read where those links are going. So if we're trying to find out exactly which inputs are being plugged into which nodes, we have to follow the line back, maybe shimmy the node group around a bit or rather the group input around a bit and then kind of see, oh yeah, that's the one. And as you're doing that, you might put it inside of a frame accidentally. So it gets very messy. So it's a little bit finicky and just not generally a good idea for, you know, readability. So it may take a bit of time, but you know, one thing I like to do is kind of shift D, duplicate the group input, then maybe, you know, plug a couple of vectors in here. So uh, which scale is it that's the uh, blots scale for that one and the blots scale for that one as well so now we've got this kind of region plugged in with the group input selected press ctrl h and it's going to collapse that down so now these ones are nicely contained and very easy to read as well and if you like you can also collapse that group input entirely there if you don't need to read them and that will basically you know condense it properly so it's up to you exactly how you want to do that but just for the sake of readability it's uh you know easier to have everything put into group input 
notes like this and condense them down. Now I may be hypocritical because I'm pretty sure there are a lot of versions of like some of my older materials up on Gumroad and Blender Market which are not done like this. But just to give you another demonstration, here was a kind of work in progress update for my ambient grunge package which I never got around to finishing. But inside of the material, if you were give me a moment to set this up, I had updated things to use this collapsed group input method. So as you can see here, there are a bunch of inputs for managing the ambient occlusion mask. But what I'm doing is a bit like a circuit board, importing those inputs in one location and then sending off the different variations of the ambient occlusion mask in different locations. So these are going to be sent to different parts of the material to be used. So they're all coming in in one place and then being sent off. I'm not going to show you the whole material because people are paying for it, but that's just to explain that it's a nice effective way of kind of organizing things. So the third tip I want to give you is actually something I've made and it's called the node sync tool. So basically in the Holt tools add-on, which is free, you can download that. We have a couple of options up here called set defaults and get defaults. It's in the cleanup panel and under the materials tab. So what this feature does is it lets you set the parameters you have for these node groups as the default values in one click. Now this is super, super important if you're building a material pack and you're making all of these node groups because traditionally what you would do is you would click on one of these node groups, you'd go in, press N, then go to the group tab here. Then you would go to each of these inputs and then write the defaults there. Doing this for every single one of the values for every single one of your node groups is a ridiculous waste of time. Now all you do is you just set them to what you want them to be. So for example, I mean, we can change this kind of in the 3D view there, make it what we want. And then with that node group selected and as many of them as you like, you can just click on them and press set defaults and it automatically makes those values the defaults. So no more having to go into every node group and change the default for every value. It's just one button press. So let me undo that. Another thing you can do with that is see which of them you have not set the defaults for. So for example, I can expose myself here because in my modular metals package, a lot of these values I have aren't even set to the default. So if I press get defaults and if you watch those node groups, you can see all of those values change there. So back, get them back, get them, etc. So that's another thing because you can't always remember whether you have set the defaults or not because you're not going to go in looking at all of the defaults just to double check. So this tool has exposed my forgetfulness. So uh, it's a bit embarrassing, but it just goes to show that it actually helps. Okay, so this last tip is about making your own node group tools. What I mean by that is there are a lot of things you'll do in the shader editor which are kind of repetitive tasks. And as well as making node groups just for your materials, you can also use them as tools. So for example, again, taking the ambient occlusion demonstration, we could make an ambient occlusion node and we could make a card ramp and go through all of that business, you know, just to make our mask, etc. blah, 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 how boring. Or we could slightly speed up the process by making our own get AO node and plugging that in and then setting the minimum and maximum from AO like that. So it's condensed inside of one small node. Okay, so we can open that up and see that it's just a map range going on there. Now this is available for free because again, I have a package on Gumroad called Node Group Tools. So you can get a hold of these for yourself. They are asset browser compatible as well, of course. So you can have them there and just drag them into your shader nodes. But it's not just about condensing things like that. So for example, I have a noise H node here because there's something that I always like doing where if we pass the noise texture through a separate color node and take the hue, you can get really interesting like coffee stain like patterns. Pattern. So if I plug that in, you can see that here. And then of course we can mix these together with a mix RGB node. So let me use the get AO as the factor and the noise as color one and then plug that in. And then here we go. We've got like a nice kind of painterly effect going on and you know, we can change the color of things as we go. So basically just having these little node group tools here are handy for helping you to speed up your workflow process. But of course they can be a bit more mathematical as well. So let me show you another demonstration. So let me set these to the muddy metal material, which is one of the demonstration materials in my procedural patterns package. So in here we have the imperfection splotch node group and you're going to see something interesting here. We have a group input, we have four node groups of some kind, and then we have a bunch of generated textures. There are different kinds, Musgrave and Voronoi. So here's the thing. Each of these generated textures has a unique scale as their default. So you can see 6.0, 3.7, 33.4 and 25.3. They also have unique other values like unique details, dimension, lacunarity, etc. Now when making a procedural material you might set those values to their perfect ones in relation to each other so you might have like a small Voronoi with like a really high scale for doing like dots on top of another type of generated texture so you're creating like the perfect pattern but scale is a problem because when the user goes to adjust the scale if you just plug that value into each of those generated textures the scale is going to be identical for all of them so like your tiny Voronoi dots might become like huge and kind of off scale in proportion with the other textures so basically the way to solve that would be to multiply them. So actually, let me just demonstrate that to show you how wrong it will look. So if we move these out the way and just plug the scale into each of them, 
Keep in mind the material here. Now the scales are wrong. We've got these weird splotches here. Some of these dots are bigger, like, you know, these noisy bits are kind of off balance. It doesn't really make sense. So if I reset that, the way you would do this usually is say, take a math node, set it to multiply. We would maybe make like the first value in this case six and then multiply it by the scale, for example, and then plug that in. So there we have like the unique value and then the scale is going to multiply that value for us. So we would have like a unique one of these for each one of those textures. That's one way of doing it. There are other kind of creative mathematical ways you can adjust things like that. But for me, that would have been a bit time consuming, you know, making a multiply node for each one of these. And also not just for the scale, but also for the detail, dimension and all these other values if you wanted to scale them appropriately. So what I've done is make what I call multiply boards. So there are two sizes for these. There are the four times multiply boards and the 10 times. And basically all these are four are for setting the unique values. So one, two, three, four. This is the detail one. So detail number one, number two. And we don't need three and four for this one because the detail is just for the Musgrave. Then you plug the user defined value as the multiplier. And then the outputs one and two are going to go to the first and the second generated texture there. Then afterwards, you can press control H and hide the unnecessary values. So now this single node is being the multiplier for both of the textures. So again, this is more important for the scale. So for example, just to fix that scale again, if I press Control H to expand the scaling, value one is 6.0, which is for this one. So let me plug one into there. And the user defined scale being our multiplier is plugged into the multiplier value. Let me select that, press Control H to hide all of them. So now the scales for each of the generated textures in this material are being multiplied by the user value. We can collapse that and it's all managed in one node. Okay, so that's an example of a more functional or mathematical type of node group that is basically a workflow time saver. So you can find those down here in my node groups package as multiplier board 4x and 10x. Now, if I drag that in, we can actually have a look inside and you can see that it's just multiply nodes. We're just multiplying the input values by the user defined multiplier and then outputting them. It's literally just about saving the number of nodes we have in the node tree to simplify things. Okay, so I think that'll do it for our node tips. Hopefully you found some of this interesting. These are just a few notes that you might want to keep in mind. But of course, you know, everyone has their own unique ways of doing shader things, procedural materials, etc. I mean, I don't even use some of the traditional workflow add-ons like Node Wrangler and stuff like that. And there's a lot of actual like personalization and stylization when it comes to laying out your node groups, because I know a lot of people like to go like really hard on the circuit board type styles where they're, you know, basically making node links everywhere, you know, rerouting things. So like the node links are going around like other parts of their materials. That's fine. Like there's definitely no right or wrong way about it. And at the end of the day, you're just trying to get a result. But hopefully you found some of this interesting. And if you did, then maybe you can check out some of the other videos on my channel. We've got a wide variety of content on here. And of course, we are also continuously building new tools and resources for the Blender community. So if you want to check out some of that stuff, head on over to curtishold.online slash store, where you'll be able to find a bunch of free and paid resources and add-ons to uh, help improve your workflow and your artwork. And also I want to give a massive thank you to our patrons. And you can see their names here. Basically, anyone that signs up to the Patreon will get their name put permanently on this evolving piece of artwork called the Hold of Patrons. And if you made it this far through the video, I would like you to put an emoji in the comments so I can see who you are. And the emoji I would like you to put is the spaghetti emoji because we've been dealing with a bunch of noodles throughout this video. It's quite fun to call the node links noodles. Anyway, yeah, thanks for watching everyone. Have a fantastic day and I will see you next time.